it gives me great pleasure to introduce Steve Redburn. Um, and Steve is, um, I'll be introducing Steve in terms of background in a second, but having Steve over is a product of a relationship we have with um, Carnegie Mellon, and Terry Bus over there I'd like to acknowledge runs the Carnegie Mellon operation in Australia, based in Adelaide. And we're very grateful to Carnegie Mellon for um, bringing over, this is the second of um, um, very uh, interesting speakers that we brought up to Canberra by virtue, virtue of the sort of collaboration we have with Carnegie Mellon. And we're looking forward to that growing in the future, so thank you, Terry. Um, so Steve is going to talk today about rescuing the United States from fiscal crisis, an easy, easy challenge, I think, but just... Uh, you have all the solutions. Um, and Steve is incredibly well um, positioned to talk about these matters. He's been on two major commissions. One is project director of the Patterson Pew National Commission on Budget Reform, and the other is a project director on the newest National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Public Administration's Commission on US Fiscal Future. And I'm sure you're here because you've uh, under no illusions about how severe this kind of um, fiscal challenge is. And we were just over lunch looking at some of the numbers. I mean, it's difficult to visualize um, 1.4 trillion um, US dollars, oh, 1.4 trillion Australian dollars, or any dollars for that matter. Um, and by the way, some of you might have picked up, um, there was a bit of an error, and we were gonna blame Terry for this in the blurb. This notion uh, that Steve picked up that, was it, as originally written, 1.4, the US is due to spend 1.4 trillion dollars in, Add another 1.4 trillion dollars in debt every year from now on. No, it's this year. We're not. We're not. So don't don't ask any um, vicious questions about the assumption that that's going to continue forever and ever. But that works out at about um, $100,000 per U.S. taxpayer and about $45,000 per U.S. citizen per legal um, legal resident in the United States. So that gives you. Actually, I don't think that was too bad when you express it like that. But anyway, that gives you some. Ex um, it's always difficult to visualise what these numbers mean. So um, I think without, I think that's probably enough I need to say, and over to you, Steve. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in Canberra. It's my first visit. Looking forward to talking with all of you. Probably wonder why I've come all this way from Washington, D.C. to talk about our problems. I think the answer is in the title there. We're, we're looking for help. And uh, <laughs> Australia is a good, good role model, actually, for the U.S. Uh, we have much less debt uh, than we do, among other things. Um, the challenge facing the U.S. Um, is really, um, it really consists of three nested or interlocking problems. And I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. Uh, each of those problems is a 10 on a 1 to 10 scale of difficulty, I would say, or close to it. And the U.S. must solve them all, and uh, fairly soon, or uh, we, we're not going to escape with our dignity, our economy, and our power intact. And I believe that Australia will, will notice the change, if only because the U.S. economy's weight in the world is such that it will affect the world economy, and its reach and its commitments around the world are so many that uh, when we can't keep those commitments, there will be a change. I'm not saying it will be, I won't try to characterize it as a, the change, but it will be substantial. So we hope that that does not uh, come to pass, uh, not only for those reasons, but because of what would happen, what would happen in the U.S. So um, let me describe the three problems quickly uh, together, and then I'll talk about each one. First, at the core is a fiscal and economic challenge. I'd say this is the problem. And second, surrounding that problem and blocking action is an institutional failure, which is the failure of the budget and, and policy making process in Washington, and therefore a reform challenge, how to make that process work again. And third, surrounding the other two challenges is a political, political challenge. And that's, uh, in this case, the toughest kind of political problem, which I'll describe. Toughest kind of problem for leaders to, to deal with and to, and to talk candidly to the public about, to voters. They have to lead and they have to convince themselves first and their peers and the public uh, to change course, and that's going to be difficult. So let me talk about each of these in turn. And <clears throat> I won't give you a lot of numbers and st statistical analysis. What I would like to do is use a metaphor, which is a nautical metaphor. This is a basically, having thought about it for a while, a problem in navigation. Uh, if the federal government were a big ship, it would be headed for the rocks. 
Uh, the fiscal course, therefore, is unsustainable. We need to change course. Uh, Herb Stein, famous economist, uh, late Herb Stein, uh, said that if something can't continue, it will stop. Stein's law. And this is one of those situations. So the first challenge, then, is to stabilize and lower the publicly held debt. Uh, there's <coughs> there is a, a cumulative, cumulative debt limited by statute in the U.S. at $14.3 trillion. Now that we understand what a trillion dollars means, I can use that figure. Um, and a, a good part of that, about $10 trillion currently, is publicly held. That is, it's held by private investors, both in the U.S. and abroad. <laughs> About uh, a little less than half of it is held abroad by governments as well as private investors. And most of that matures within three to five years, short, fairly short term on average. Um, and the debt, that portion of the debt, that $10 trillion, uh, will surpass 70 percent of the size of the U.S. economy by the end of this fiscal year, which is the end of se September. Um, that is, it will equal or surpass 70 percent of GDP, the gross domestic product, to give you, and that's, that's the reference point. How big is the debt relative to the U.S. economy? And it will continue to rise because it takes a long time to change course. This is a big ship. You can't turn a big ship quickly. Um, so under the most likely set of policies, it will approach 90 to 100 percent of GDP by 2020. Uh, and these amounts do not include the amounts held by lower levels of government, by state and local governments, who also have substantial debt. Uh, nor do they include trillions of dollars of unfunded commitments that are not currently uh, financed and will be converted to future debt after 2020. But, and <clears throat> that's a very large number. I, don't, I won't give you a number because it's too far out, but the present value of that is quite large. And it, driven substantially in the near term, the next 10 to 20 years, by demographic changes, which are more or less inevitable. The aging of the population, the shrinking of the workforce relative to the size of the dependent population during that period. So as the debt moves higher, that is, we, as we approach the rocks, we move, obviously, into greater danger. Uh, there's a danger that uh, a ship headed for the rocks will actually founder, or it may run aground. Um, much in the manner of the Japanese economy. The Japanese have a very substantial debt. And um, so we could end up on the rocks um, if we don't change course, or we could end up with our economy stagnating for a decade and little or no economic growth, and that would compound the problem. So how, how close is too close is one problem for the captain and captain of the ship and observers to try to wrestle with. Um, around the world, people have used as a benchmark, uh, including the European community, 60 percent, using a somewhat different measure of debt, by the way, 60 percent of GDP as kind of a, uh, a standard. Of, but, but there's no scientific or way to arrive at an exact number, and there's no magic number. It's like the problem faced by a ship headed for the rocks. That is, how close can you go and still be safe? Well, that depends on the tides, it depends on the winds, it depends on a lot of things that you can't predict. So it's a matter of judgment, and a seasoned ship captain will know, have some idea of just what is, how close you can go to a lee shore, how, how close you can get to the rocks. So we were <coughs> working, um, starting about three years ago, I was working with the uh, study committee of the National Research Council and the National Academy of Public Administration on this problem. And by then, it was, it was pretty well understood that we were on an unsustainable path. I think people in Washington understood it. In fact, every year, the President's budget printed an analysis that said, said exactly that, as did the Congressional Budget Office, uh, their counterparts for the Congress. Uh, so the MacArthur Foundation funded this effort to uh, bring experts together to look at what do we do about this. And, and they spent most of their time not just describing the fiscal challenge, but thinking about the set, different sets of policy changes, different ways we could change course and avoid the rocks. And the good news out of that effort, took two years of study, is that there, there are many ways of avoiding hitting the rocks. There are many routes that won't hit the rocks. And at that point, 
um, they laid out a, a whole uh, illustrative range of possibilities, some of which on the low end appeal to, appeal to uh, people who believe in small government and low taxation and low spending, and those could keep the, the budget about its present size, but balance it over time. And at the high end, uh, something approaching the level of several European countries that where the government is a much larger share of the, of the economy. So was, there were many paths of, to avoid hitting uh, the rocks. Um, as time has gone by, there are fewer and fewer options. Uh, debt has risen. As I said, it's a matter of judgment how close you can get to the rocks. But one thing is certain, the closer you get, the sharper the turn you're going to have to make to avoid the, the more painful the policy choices and the fewer the good choices and the, the, the fewer options to gradually introduce new policies such as changes for younger people that would allow them to plan for retirement on the basis that the, their pensions and medical care are not going to be so generous. Those would be fairly easy to, to implement, but they wouldn't necessarily avoid hitting the rocks as you get closer. Instead, it's more likely that we're going to pitch some things overboard and that it'll be more of a violent turn um, because of where we are now and where we are headed. When we started doing this work in 2008, we were on the verge of a, a serious financial debacle and uh, a great recession in the U.S. And uh, somebody said that as we went into that period that uh, we, we didn't know how, how, long, how far we were from a potential fiscal crisis, but uh, we were now five years closer. Uh, and two more years have passed since then. And other things have happened. I asked him, where are we now? And he said, well, maybe we're 12 years closer. <laughs> we still don't know. Again, it's a matter of judgment. We still don't know how far off, how much time we have um, to deal with this. But it's already too late to avoid deep pain, certainly. Um, and right now, we're looking at uh, <clears throat> an, a need to find, over the next 10 years, four to five trillion dollars worth of savings relative to the baseline, relative to the course that we're on, given current policies. So our options are narrowing. Um, as they narrow, this may pre preclude uh, making new investments that would help, in the future, sustain economic vitality and economic growth especially in the face of uh, the drag uh, of a declining, shrinking workforce, which is certainly going to slow productivity uh, and economic growth in that period of time. So we may not have that set of options. Obviously, if we could grow faster in the future, uh, that would help relieve the pain over this long period of time. But that may, may no longer be an easy thing to do, to add money to the budget for those important investments, whatever they turn out to be may be difficult when all we really need, all we really have room to do is to, to either raise taxes or cut spending <clears throat> from where we are now. So um, as you delay, and politically the easy thing is to delay and say, let's take one more year, let's wait till after the next presidential election. As you delay, you also add to the eventual cost. Not only is the turn sharper, but the absolute uh, dollar amount that you need to save is greater, and that's true for a couple of reasons. One is another cohort, an, another age cohort of people will have retired in that period of time, and the, the typical uh, policy change proposal for programs affecting the elderly is to hold harmless those who are at or very near retirement. So if you hold those people harmless and it's another group of people who retire without being subject to the reductions in their pensions or their medical care. Um, that uh, is a permanent extra cost. There's also the permanent extra cost of having to bear the debt service on a higher mountain of debt that has accumulated in the meantime. So we did simulations with the study committee of these things and found that it was a fairly substantial absolute increase in cost as well as risk uh, from delay. So how close can we steer to the reef, and how long can we wait without a violent maneuver? Those are the problems that are, uh, people are wrestling with now. Um, the biggest problem, perhaps, with waiting is not what I just talked about, but really that the margin of error diminishes 
And there are out there, we don't know what they are, but there are out, out there black swans, events uh, that are unpredictable and large in their consequences, but could easily throw us onto the rocks during this period of time. So if you run along a lee shore for some period of time, the longer you run along that shore, the more likely it is that a stray gust of wind or a storm or something else is going to put you in an unrecoverable position. So it's that risk. It's, uh, it's not easily quantified, obviously. Um, <clears throat> now, debt changes fairly slowly. So it, it creates the illusion that you have time. But some things uh, that can affect debt and also your overall spending position is uh, are, uh, change much more rapidly. Interest rates change much more, rap more rapidly relative to revenues. That ratio can change very rapidly. Uh, in fact, we have uh, historically low interest rates in the U.S. today, uh, virtually effectively zero. And therefore, the, it creates the illusion that you have low debt service, it, cre it masks the amount of debt and therefore the potential risk that you have. But that in those interest rates could increase by two or three fold. In fact, even with a robust economic recovery, they're almost certain to increase by that order, by that magnitude over the next few years. And with it, with the short term debt, uh, duration of debt, average three to five years, and a doubling or tripling of interest rates on that debt, you could very quickly squeeze the other parts of the budget and force even more drastic choices in that period of time. So it's really, if you're looking at this uh, in, ter in terms of risk as an economist or a fiscal planner, you need to consider that ratio, which is much more volatile in the short run. If on top of that, in investors get a whiff of danger here, uh, which they could at any point, and add a risk premium to your interest rate, then interest rates could rise as they have, for example, in Greece and other European countries. And along the Mediterranean that uh, could rise very rapidly for that reason as well. So you could have within three to five years as debt rolls over and has to be refunded uh, a very dramatically different demand for spending simply to service that, that now much larger mountain of debt. Uh, and you get into a downward spiral from which it's very difficult to recover. Some economists ha having looked at the history of financial crises that often turn into f fiscal crises because the public sector absorbs more of the risk and more of the debt that was taken on by the private sector during those periods, will we'll <coughs> have estimated that uh, when, it, when debt gets above 90 percent of GDP, and again, people use different measures of debt, so this is only a very loose measure or rule of thumb, uh, becomes much harder to recover, and the economic drag <coughs> Uh, from simply being at that level of, of debt uh, makes it even more difficult to recover. Now, the U.S. is in a somewhat different position than other countries because it uh, has been the world's reserve currency. It's been a store of safety and, uh, again, it's looked like a place, safe place to put your money when Europe, European countries look less safe, so even more so perhaps in the last couple of years, again, masking perhaps the nature of the problem that we face for now. Um, some people have, have uh, written in the United States about the possibility of that investors would wake up and realize that the U.S. is, in fact, a risky place and that that risk premium or surge in interest uh, demand, demands of, bar, of people who are willing to uh, buy our debt would send a s signal to policymakers that they need to do something. But the history of that is not very encouraging. And particularly since the U.S. is uh, the world's reserve currency, it seems that it's more likely that uh, the, the market, rather than sending a, an early signal that would help the politicians react and take the tough choices they need to take, is actually going to lag. And that's been the pattern for many of these crises in the past and give us more rope rather than help us uh, focus. So that's the, f that's the core problem. And we can talk about that during our the conversation period after this. Let me talk next about the next layer of problems, which are institutional. And this is the set of problems I've been working on as study director for the Peterson Pew Commission on Budget Reform uh, for the last year and a half. Um, the U.S. has a broken budget process. In fact, last year, uh, 
He didn't pass any of the appropriations uh, required to finance uh, annually appropriated programs until uh, the middle of the fiscal year, until the middle of this, I'm talking about this fiscal year. They didn't pass any in the previous Congress by the time the fiscal year began uh, last October. And it was only after a, an odd hoax centralized negotiation between the executive branch and the congressional leadership that they finally agreed on uh, a package of budget of, of spending cuts of about $38 billion that they were able to get approval for uh, permanent approval for authority to spend for 40 percent of the budget halfway through the fiscal year. So that's just one indicator of the extent to which the current process is broken. And there are other indicators, but if you just look at the process, it's very short-sighted. Uh, it is uh, completely lacking in the discipline that a fiscal rule that people had either accepted or enacted uh, as a disciplining standard, such as a balanced budget requirement, would impose, or, or a fiscal target or goal uh, would impose. There's no discipline from those sources. Uh, it's a stovepiped and, and disaggregated process, and there's no regular review of major parts of the budget. About 60 percent of the spending programs are on autopilot. They're so-called mandatory entitlement programs, and they're not reviewed on a regular basis. And uh, we have in the, on the revenue side of the budget, in the revenue code, we have special provisions that treat income from certain sources or, or used in, in certain ways uh, differently than other income, and those shelter those uses and sources from taxation, and cumulatively they take about $1.2 trillion of potential revenue out of the revenue base. So they function like spending programs, and because they don't look like spending, they seem to reduce the size of government. Uh, but they also subsidize particular activities. Um, they are a very, they've become a very popular device, and they escape scrutiny in the annual process. There's no regular process for reviewing tax expenditures, 1.2 trillion, which in total is more than the income tax revenue that the government collected last year. So the, the budget process is broken down, and even if it we're working better, it would not be up to the task we face now, which is not a, a, a standard uh, short-term deficit problem, but a long-term problem driven by demographics and driven also by uh, the rapid rise in medical costs, not just for government, but through a, throughout that whole sector um, for the foreseeable future. So the, <clears throat> this commission has recommended uh, in its report, uh, Getting Back in the Black, which was issued in December of last year, uh, a series of reforms or changes in the way that budget process works, including putting in law a medium-term target for the debt. Uh, their, their recommendation two years ago was that we stabilize the debt at 60 percent of GDP by 2018. Remember, we're, we're now approaching 70 percent of GDP, and it will be a while before we can turn the ship, so it's going to be difficult. Um, we all, this commission has also recommended enacting a long-term fiscal rule uh, to balance revenues and spending on a economic si over an economic cycle on average, essentially a balanced budget requirement that uh, would bind leaders uh, to that standard and would reestablish what had been a consensus in U.S. Po policy that, uh, that except in periods of war or other emergency, uh, budget should be balanced, which is a common sense notion, uh, or close to it. Fiscal rules uh, function uh, to bind leaders to good policies when they are facing short-term temptations to, to deviate. Um, to use, since this is a nautical theme, to use a nautical metaphor, Odysseus asked his crew to bind him to the mast as he approached the island of the sirens and plugged their ears so they couldn't hear the calls. And, said, if you know, I struggle to, to get free, bind me tighter. 80% of the developed countries around the world have a fiscal rule, either in statute or by consensus or in their constitutions, as the Swiss do. Um, that's not an option for the U.S. because it's too, uh, takes too long and it's too un uncertain a path to try to amend the 
U.S. Constitution, but, but they could put it in statute. Um, <clears throat> the Commission made various recommendations to strengthen the process that um, take into account the fact that we have a, 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 an unusual system of government where, where power and responsibility for the budget are shared and fought over by two branches of government, the Congress and the President. Uh, <clears throat> they're like two captains on the bridge fighting for control of the wheel uh, all the time. So we have to take that into account. So there, there need to be separate requirements on the President to submit a budget that is adhering to the fiscal rule and will meet a medium-term target for the debt. And then there have to be processes that discipline the members of Congress in both the House and the Senate to to do the same. Um, and the president, the president has to sign the result, so uh, there has to be that. So th it will be very difficult to enact these kinds of reforms, but uh, institutionally they're probably required in order to solve the first problem. It's, uh, again, in keeping with the metaphor, it's like rebuilding the ship while it's under sail. Uh, but this has to be done at the same time. And <clears throat> Another thing that uh, would, would be helpful in this situation is for there to be enacted some sort of fail-safe trigger that would automatically adjust spending and revenues or tax expenditures if leaders fail to act appropriately in a certain period of time. A trigger mechanism is designed not necessarily to be used, but to be so unpleasant in its prospects that leaders are incentive, have the incentive to act responsibly to avoid it. And that's another proposal. Um, and there are many others in that package. So that's the second problem, the second layer of problem. And then the third challenge, the, the outer ring or sphere here, is the, is the challenge to political leadership. And to continue the nautical metaphor, this requires keeping the captain on the bridge, or captains in this case, since we have divided authority between the Congress and the President. We have at least two people fighting for the wheel. While down below, the crew is threatening to mutiny and is split into factions, and one, side, one, one part of the crew wants to go in this direction to avoid the rocks, and another part wants to go in the, the other direction. So the, the crew is basically split into feuding factions at this point. Uh, this is the toughest kind of political problem for leaders to deal with uh, because uh, it, in the short run, it involves pain for almost everyone, almost every major reform that you can think of uh, is less difficult because there are usually winners and losers. That's difficult enough when there are winners and losers. But in the short run here, there are only losers. That is, everyone is going to have to take some of the pain in order to solve this problem. It's of that magnitude. Uh, one side also has taken the position that none of the solutions can involve an increase in taxes. So already, uh, we've uh, they've said that a uh, <coughs> solution that would be necessary uh, and involve pain for everyone has to exclude that set of policies. So we are in a difficult situation. The public is highly distrustful of leaders and, and public institutions. And in fact, uh, in the surveys, uh, it's at a record low. Trust of leaders is at a record low. This has nothing to do with who's in power. It's just a, a long-term secular trend toward distrust of leaders. And the atmosphere is poisonously partisan in Washington and around the country. Um, gener generally, leaders have looked on addressing this problem candidly and head-on as a political suicide mission, which it may well be. Um, so how can they be convinced otherwise? This, this is a, a political problem of the first order for a a government that is designed partly to make it difficult to enact big changes. That's how it was designed. And especially in the current political environment. A, sh a ship has only one captain, ideally. Um, democracy has many or may have none, depending on how you look at it. Um, leaders are not going to be able to act and act in time unless they gain wide public understanding of the risks and the costs of not acting. But there hasn't been that kind of dialogue yet. So while the public has now raised its awareness and it has rated this problem close to the economy's um, inability to create enough jobs as the top problem 
or problems facing uh, the United States. Uh, they have not yet agreed on a solution or co really contemplated what the implications are for them and what they're willing to accept. And they, there needs to be that dialogue probably before that we'll get to a solution. In January, a uh, bipartisan commission appointed by President Obama reported and came up with a plan endorsed by 12 of the 18 members, uh, including Republicans and Democrats, that would save $4 trillion over 10 years, essentially doing most of the work that needs to be done. Uh, but that has as yet not been endorsed by the President, although he has indicated general support for a framework that would be consistent with that. There's a, there are also bipartisan efforts in the Senate that involve five or six senators from both parties to come up with a, a similar plan. There are, there are ongoing negotiations now, which I'll say a little bit more about, uh, led by the Vice President, Vice President Biden, behind closed doors to try to fashion some sort of package. And <clears throat> an action is being blocked for two reasons, principally, in addition to the one I mentioned one of them, which is one party has been captured by the, by the idea that revenues can never increase. So that's currently blocking action. And the other is the polarization of the politics of health care. The health care piece of this is the biggest piece because it's the biggest driver of the long-term problem. It has a demographic element as well as a cost element. And uh, the Republicans who now control the House uh, and the chair of their budget committee, Paul Ryan, have introduced a package uh, that would eliminate the largest medical care program for the elderly, Medicare, and replace it with a, a voucher that would only partly uh, pay for the uh, medical needs of the elderly. And in doing so, essentially has polarized that part of the debate and caused uh, the other side to come to the defense of Medicare, which is an extremely popular program. Um, and that has made it more difficult to compromise. So in the short term, we seem to be blocked. At the same time, we are facing a, an artificial crisis, or maybe it's a real one, because there's a statutory limit on the debt. And we're now approaching that limit. In fact, we actually we, uh, are at the limit of $14.3 trillion, but the Treasury has some uh, fancy footwork that it can do to keep uh, aloft and avoid uh, having to default on the debt for some period of time, probably until the end of July or early August, according to the Secretary. It's hard to know. You, you know, the, I think you probably know the old Roadrunner cartoons where the coyote is chasing the Roadrunner and runs off the cliff. And for a while, he's suspended in midair. And yeah, then he looks down. Don't look down. Uh, if you look down, you'll fall. Well, we're kind of there. We're suspended in midair. We're off the cliff already on that one. So that puts some pressure on leaders to act. And they are, they are trying to uh, ridge this partisan gulf, this ideological gulf, behind closed doors in negotiations. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. On the other hand, uh, we can't go much longer without uh, a, at least a technical default on the debt. So uh, it's a it's a tenuous and somewhat exciting situation that we're in at the moment. And maybe some people would say it's an opportunity. There's an artificial crisis of this sort. Uh, might be the best opportunity we'll have between now and the election of the next president uh, to, to take a bite, at least, out of this problem, if there can be agreement. And as has been true, the pattern of these closed-door negotiations to, that have have developed in lieu of a functioning budget process and res a responsible dialogue between leaders and the public, um, the pattern has been that people do at the last minute come to some kind of agreement that lets them save face and get to the next uh, crisis, which might be a little farther down the road. And we may see that. So uh, I don't make predictions ordinarily, and I, I wouldn't try to predict this one. Um, but it's possible that uh, we may end up with some sort of package, maybe on the order of a trillion dollars or more of savings, combined with an agreement to impose some of the, uh, some form of fiscal rule or, or caps on spending uh, or target or triggers of the sort that the uh, Peterson Pew Commission and others have been recommending to impose future discipline and to require that within the next few years at least, 
uh, leaders come back together and find the rest of the, the solution. So there, there's sort of there's an opti optimistic view that in this situation leaders in a democratic uh, context can can lead, can can frame the debate and alter public's, the public's perception and expand their tolerance for the kinds of difficult choices that have to be made. Uh, Paul Posner, a friend of mine and colleague, has written a paper about how, uh, called Does It, Will It Take a Crisis, that argues that, that it is possible through leadership and compromise uh, to come up with uh, an agreement for uh, shared responsibility between the two parties. And there are, there are patterns for this, both in the US, historically, and in other countries. Other countries may not have the same political system or lack of consensus that we, that we have. And then there's the pessimistic view um, that there will be gridlock and meltdown. Or we may, we may somehow muddle through, which the US usually does. So <clears throat> we have those three problems. I've shared them with you. This is appropriately called rescuing the US from fiscal crisis. So if anybody has a rescue plan, now is the time to, to tell me about it. And I'll take it back to Washington with me. And glad to take any questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> sure, so sure. we'll just kick off uh, first question. Um, Peter. Christine, you're banned on uh, increased taxation on one side of the Right. Does that extend to tax expenditures? Um, <clears throat> that's been a theological debate. And um, the, the, um, the priesthood on that side would say yes. yes that's yes. <coughs> Anything that looks, smells, walks, and talks like a tax, like a tax increase, is a tax increase. Others would argue, yeah, that's that's really spending through the tax code, so we can define it as spending, and therefore it's not a tax increase when we deal with that. Um, by the way, if we if we were to take those on, uh, there would be some gains for that side in the sense that the tax code now is widely recognized as a drag on economic growth and a horror because of all these special provisions and its complexity and very inefficient revenue raiser. Uh, so we could probably fashion something that would lower rates, especially on corporations. The corporate tax structure in the U.S. is uh, not as high as it looks on paper, but, uh, but it's probably uh, a contributor to our lack of competitiveness. Or, that is, we could be much more competitive if we would reform that structure. Uh, so there, and a lot of Republicans understand that. So there ought to be elements there that would appeal to re, uh, responsible people who want to do something about the tax code and don't want to raise taxes. Um, oh, yeah, so we should, we should probably wait for microphones for the recording. Sorry. <laughs> so if you could give me warning with your hands, we can line up the second mic. Okay. Uh, look, you, you made mention of the importance of the reserve currency masking the uh, problems in the United States. Yes, sir. So I in one way, uh, you know, if they buy a, you know, oil and everything else is dominated in US dollars, the US can just print more money and keep buying it. Or alternatively, if they don't do something about the problem, having a reserve currency in US dollars means the rest of the world is going to be affected if the US doesn't solve problems, is it not? I, I think if the U.S. doesn't solve the problems, uh, there are many reasons why the rest of the world will be affected dramatically. But um, to your point, and I'm not a, an expert in public finance, so don't, mis don't assume that I am. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's not certain that the U.S. will always be the world's reserve currency. I think uh, we have international institutions that can figure out alternatives. Uh, if they have some time to adjust. So I wouldn't assume that simply because the dollar uh, no longer has, uh, is, is a, you know, has the current uh, respect that it, that it, ha that it has as a, as a safe way to hold value, that, that that's always going to be true, at least not in relative terms. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you've talked about the institutional uh, failures and the political challenges. Um, what about the uh, willingness of the American public to make these uh, unnecessary uh, sacrifices, as you've uh, mentioned? Because if you look at the Paul uh, Ryan Medicare plan, mm -hmm. um, no doubt there were 
a few uh, touchy issues about it o mm -hmm. overall, but the principles of it were quite consistent with <coughs> uh, making uh, savings in the budget. Mm. And if we look at the message that the American public uh, sent to the Republicans after that, you know, they even uh, lost the House seat. You know, clearly there's a message that you know, do not touch these things that we like. Mm. In this case, then, how can there be substantial uh, cuts if uh, the, the politicians are going to have to be really careful, you know, we can't go here, we can't go there, right. so where can it cut? Right. Uh, it's it's uh, a matter of changing the way the, the public thinks about this and allowing them to uh, accept, uh, you know, think in a more sophisticated way about it uh, and allow them to accept policies that are currently unacceptable. Uh, I said the debate about Medicare was polarized, but I think there is a reasonable position, uh, or a number of them, on how to adjust and control uh, the growth of med medical costs, health care costs. Uh, you, remember, you probably know that the U.S. went through an enormous debate about health care reform last year, and embedded in that legislation are a number of ideas that will be implemented uh, unless uh, the Republicans block implementation. Uh, that have real prospects of, of slowing the growth, at least many people think so. There's no certainty that any one of those will work, uh, but if they do, or some combination of them do, that will help solve the problem. And then another set of, a uh, fairly long list of reasonable proposals that would help uh, gradually slow the growth of medical care costs without imposing unreasonable burdens on the public, the elderly. But I think Paul Ryan's plan has probably been, been character, mischaracterized. It's really uh, the reason he had uh, to do what he did to Medicare, arithmetically, I believe, is because his plan included a very large and costly tax cut for the wealthy. And so if you first dig the hole deeper and then you try to fill it back up, uh, you're going to have to do some pretty ridiculous things with the arithmetic. And that's, that's what I think he was forced to do in order to make his plan achieve the savings that he needed. Hi. Um, just getting back to the reserve currency issue raised, um, uh, I think you, you noted that as a result of the US dollar being the reserve currency, it's unlikely that in the short term at least, international, the international investment community is going to um, send the sort of price signal, <coughs> ring right. the alarm bell as it were to the, the legislators, et cetera, et cetera to um, say you've got no other choice, as right. perhaps has occurred in, in Europe in, in, yeah, that's my in, in view. the last 12 months. You, I don't know if you agree with that or not. Well, well I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm taking it to its logical conclusion. Rather than say that that's a problem, perhaps it's the solution. Because if the international investment community is going to be behind the eight ball, then why not term out the next five years of budget deficits to 30 years and have QE three, four, five, six until the Aussie dollar's worth about 10 US dollars and <laughs> Uh, essentially inflate your way out of the out of the trouble, or or is that hitting the rocks, as it were? I, I think I think you would hit the rocks in the sense that as investors, uh, while they are late, they eventually, when it's too late for for rational uh, policies to to take effect to avoid hitting the rocks, they do react, and at that point, um, they very quickly run, and and interest rates uh, rise, or other things happen. Uh, that are equivalent. Um, so at that point, you're you're in the soup. Uh, Professor Redburn, you've yes, uh, indicated that there's two very powerful positions in the United States. One of which, presumably, the Republicans are dead, uh, steadfastly against any tax rises. Well, I should say there's a there's a controlling faction in the sure. Republican Party right. that has created a theology that all revenue increases, all tax increases are. Right bad, abhorrent, and therefore they, and they have enough leverage at the moment that you, they, they control. <clears throat> you haven't made any, any reference to the uh, phenomenal cost of, of America's military presence overseas. And given the latest review, uh, I'm not sure by whom, but it was released uh, on, in our news media in the last day or so, that an independent <coughs> review of uh, Afghanistan's position was that the uh, Karzai administration would uh, was in no position to be uh, able to look after its own affairs with the withdrawal of you know, Western forces. Yes. Is there enormous pressure in the United States to uh, end their presence in Afghanistan, both from a, 
financial position as well as from the uh, ongoing loss of U.S. military? Not yet, although that could change very quickly if the perception was that there was no uh, prospect of winning or of, of a, a graceful uh, solution within a few years. You know. uh, but I think right now, no. Uh, certainly uh, in the modeling that we did for this first study that I worked on and where we looked at alternative ways of avoiding the rocks, in every scenario there had to be reductions in military spending as a percent of GDP. Mm -hmm which would slow its growth over the next, uh, next several decades. And that would mean a real reduction in the cap capacity of the U.S. To, to do what it has been doing around the world. Um, and since there are certainly going to be conflicts in the future, as there have been in the past, which will involve enormous expenditure, um, that suggests that we need to first uh, do as much as we can to lower the debt to a safer level to give ourselves the leeway that we're going to need when those black swans or emergencies, crises appear, not knowing what they are. But uh, we, would, we would definitely have to lower defense spending. Yes? You, um, so not hitting the rocks, does that involve uh, U.S. just continuing on its uh, current level of consumption, get the wealth resources and that? No, I mean, I mean it in only the narrow fiscal sense. That is, at a certain point, it will no longer be possible for us to finance our policies at, um, at anything the level, at any level com comparable to what we've been been doing. So we'll have to withdraw and shrink our commitments both to our own people and to uh, others. That's what I mean. I have two more there. Um, we've noticed that bond markets and um, the U.S. Treasury market hasn't actually reacted to this increased risk of a default on U.S. debt due to the debt ceiling negotiations. Right. Um, what do you think that if, if the debt ceiling isn't raised, what do you think the market reaction will be? Do you think that they're going to consider this more of a political impasse and that eventually the ceiling will be raised, or do you think it's going to they're going to react the way people have reacted to that's, the European That's crisis. the big debate, or one of the big debates in the short term with regard to the debt ceiling. And there, there is a view by people who are much smarter than I am as investors, uh, bond investors, uh, that a technical default coupled with the prospect of a, sh uh, in the very short term, of a major policy agreement that changes course would be seen by investors as not so bad relative to not defaulting uh, by simply raising, or not hitting the debt ceiling, but by simply raising the debt ceiling, which allow you to continue on the present course for another few years, or however many years before you hit the rocks. So in other words, if, if they saw uh, the government's uh, leadership acting responsibly and passing a package of changes, and it meant uh, a technical default of a few days, you know, would you rather invest in a bond where you're going to have one missed payment in the short run, but you're sure it's going to pay off over the next, over the maturity of the bond? Or would you rather have a bond that is not going to miss the short term payment, but where there's a high probability it won't make the last payment? So that's the, that's the uh, investor's perspective on this. And that's one investor's perspective who's smarter than I am. So maybe it's not such a bad thing if we have this artificial crisis that forces people to agree on a big package. But I assume that risk will um, change as the time taken becomes longer to negotiate a package. That's right, yeah. I don't think investors would uh, wait two, three, four months. Uh, there has to be a pros prospect of agreement. That's right. Um, Professor Redbon, um, my question is that um, if the current high oil price persists, um, uh, how would that actually affect the budget? And um, if that actually caused another uh, short-term downturn in the economy, um, would the government prepare to stimulate the economy again in, in, in the risk of That's just, another tough, tough one. Um, that's right. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the planning here is, is uh, predicated on the economy continuing to recover and perhaps uh, recovering robustly. If through that means or some other means uh, we're pitched back into a 
a downturn, um, then all the, again, all of the choices become more difficult. Uh, the options are few at that point um, to, to take rational action, it seems to me. And, and there's, there is a debate about when you make the turn. When we were looking at this two and a half years ago, uh, the committee decided that none of the proposals that they, uh, for, that they put on the table as a way to solve the problem should take effect, should have real effects on the budget until 2012, which begins, our fiscal year begins uh, October 1st, 2011. So nothing until next year, uh, fiscal year. Um, and that seemed about right. But that wouldn't be right if we uh, had an oil shock or some other um, disruption to the economy. And that would make all the planning uh, and all, all the things I just talked about much more difficult. Um, I'd like to ask about the political system rather than the economic system. Oh, that's good. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the, a political scientist, so I, yes. I'm more comfortable there. Uh, and uh, as, as you would know, one of the big differences between the American and Australian uh, political systems is compulsory voting in Australia. Oh, really? Versus voluntary voting in, in the U.S. And what, what happens if you don't vote? You go to jail. <laughs> in the extreme. <laughs> Uh, the the proportion of people voting is is much higher uh, in, in Australia. As it would be, yeah. And what would be uh, what what would be your uh, imagination of what would happen in America if there was compulsory voting? We see right now that there's a lot of states that are trying to actually make it more difficult for people right. to vote. What would be the scenario if in, in the U S there right. was compulsory voting? Okay. Uh, well, as you know, voting rates in the U.S. are higher among more affluent and more educated people. So the conventional assumption would be if you forced people to vote that you'd get higher proportions of people at lower education and income levels, but you also would get people who are less involved and less f um, have less information on which to base their choices. So I'd say it's somewhat unpredictable, but probably uh, the Democrats would adva be advantaged by compulsory voting. That would be my guess. That's only a guess. <clears throat> Interesting question. Uh, you mentioned that the U.S. taxpayer is 129,000 in debt per person, I'm assuming. I think that is a higher dollar figure than other places in Greece and Portugal and Spain. Is it possible that the U.S. would ask for some assistance from the IMF? <laughs> That's somewhat circular, isn't it? Um, since we helped to finance the IMF. But um, that would be interesting. I don't know the IMF has its hand f hands full at the moment with Europe. Uh, so we hope they don't have to deal with both Europe and the United States at the same time. I don't know. I don't know what the source of discipline is outside the US political process, if there is one. Um, I wonder if I could encourage you to be a little bit more radical on, on in, in this talk. You see, I, sensible people don't see a problem, right? Sensible people say, well, you put the taxes up a bit, you cut the expenditure down a bit, uh, you, don't generate, you don't get too worried about a crisis, you divide it up into things you've got to do straight away, things you've got to do later. It's all relatively straightforward uh, and easy. Not, <laughs> intellectually. So, so what is the problem? And the problem is clearly the political process right, that, that in the United States. Uh, and so how has the political process been evolving? It's been evolving away from a solution, it seems to us here. You know, to have one part of the group say, OK, well, we're going to cut out the tax option is clearly not sort of the way to go. Right. Um, and that raises the issue in my mind is where do you think this political process is going, going to continue to? Like, will it move further to the right uh, in a way which does solve the problem? That is, you just focus it all on the, on the expenditure side? Or will the right sort of lose its current sort of situation and so we just keep muddling or will it swing back? Right. Or take, take, take the same question again with a slightly different approach. If you were completely outside and you said this was really a crisis, then what happens is governments really do start to swing often 
you know, governments often go right wings, governments often get dictators. Now, none of this stuff is really going to happen in the US, but something equivalent could happen. For example, the, the person who can save us all may well be Sarah Palin. Because, you know, Sarah's likely to do anything quite weird uh, and be quite radical if she gets enough power in the, in, in, in the Senate and so on, in the Congress. So where do you think the political process is going to go? Because it, just listening to you, it doesn't sound as though it's sort of going to go anywhere. Well, there is an optimistic view. There, are, there are, is political advantage, some would say, to leaders who can come together around a, a, a solution to this. They can all take credit for the solution. Um, that's, it's a somewhat, somewhat like the prisoner's dilemma. It's, you know, game theory would suggest there, there are reasons why you would want to cooperate, but that it requires a high level of trust. We don't have a high level of trust at either the leadership level or vertically between uh, followers and leaders in each party. Um, so it's uh, very possible that that could fail. But it's also possible that behind closed doors, mature people could recognize that there is a mutual political advantage in negotiating a package. And we've seen both patterns. So we've seen a number of, of bipartisan agreements, uh, including the one, starting with the one in 1990 uh, that George Bush negotiated with the Democratic Congress that included tax increases. Um, after he'd said, uh, read my hips, no new taxes, he violated that pledge. and. His, his party lost, uh, his support within his own party was weakened and he was defeated for re-election. That's, that's uh, not good history from the point of view of uh, leaders having to take courageous steps. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I think that is a possible outcome. That is, I think, based on the history of these things, that people could behind closed doors fashion a solution. What worries me is that the public uh, is not going, has not been brought along to a point where they will accept the great deal that comes out when the doors open. Uh, and it's been a near thing in the past uh, when deals like that have been brought to the Congress. And if there's enough uh, political pressure brought to bear on leaders, they will, they will not vote for it. So the leaders, uh, that is, the, their, their parties will not support it in the Congress. And we, and the 1990 agreement is an example of that as well. It was defeated the first time. And then they had to take a second vote with a lot of arm twisting to get it through. So it was a near thing. Um, it's, this is not predictable, in my view. So I wouldn't predict which way it'll go. And if, if, it, if, it, goes all, if it all goes bad, it's even more, less predictable, whether we'd see a different kind of political process than we've, we're accustomed to. You know, that's the possibilities are there for a more radical uh, change in the way we, we make political choices and the kind of leadership that we have. But I couldn't predict that. Okay, thank you. We'll make that last question because okay. we're five bit over time. So thank you very much. Mark. That was um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I made a joke for the last speaker that it's uh, we don't, we won't show whether you smoked or not, but we get you some cigarettes anyway, but they're not actually cigarettes. Look, um, I wanted to thank Olivia Wenholz for organising everything.